Greetings, 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 good people. It is a distinct privilege, and I feel you know, such pleasure to be here with this esteemed uh, group of panelists. We have Roxana, we have Sylvia, we have Marga. If you notice, I didn't say their last names, because they're more like Prince or Madonna, it's not necessary. Um, and the, the name of this uh, panel is you know, Amazing Humans in the Future. And we're really gonna dig in and, you know, for me, I've had the great pleasure of knowing these ladies for quite some time. And they really embody what we're trying to capture here. It's, you know, doing it their way and showing the correlation between authenticity and achieving, you know, the highest levels of success within their respective uh, areas, you know, professional and personal. And I think as we have these conversations, uh, you're gonna see for yourselves. About me quickly, I run a uh, venture fund. <laughs> Thank, thank you, Alan. Thank you, thank you. And the whole Female Quotient team. I run a venture fund. We back underrepresented founders who are solving for some of the biggest challenges of our time. And of course, women are a significant portion of, of what we look to uh, back and support. And the team at Female Quotient, Shelly, Talia, Marissa, everyone, they're just amazing. And it's wonderful to see the type of support that they're getting. So with that being said, we're going to start from my left and go right with some quick intros. Go for it, Roxana. Okay, so Roxana Chirusek Gedir. That's why he says he's not going to pronounce my surname. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but, so yes, it's um, so I I am a financier and an artist with a big passion for impact and sustainability. Even though these words are being overused, but I I have a really <laughs> genuine passion for many years uh, planted in my family. And uh, what I do now, I actually, after over 20 years in finance, in the corporate job, I've decided to work for myself. So I lead a portfolio life. Uh, so work with companies uh, that are um, doing something in the future, uh, that are doing something that is in accordance with my philosophy and values. Uh, so I'm chairing impact advisory boards for two companies. I'm also an impact investor, and I create art with purpose. Thank you, Roxana. Thank you. Go ahead, Sylvia. All right. I feel her family name was too short, people. <laughs> Sylvia, Console, Batirana. That's why he didn't say it. <laughs> Pleasure to meet you, everyone. Um, I am a nerd undercover. I'm a Stanford PhD. I started a company that does uh, multi-billion dollar auctions with my co-founder, who's also a little bit more of a nerd. He has a nobody in economics. And uh, we do a lot of the radio spectrum auctions. Uh, he actually invented them. So the reason why you can transmit package of data on your phone is because 25 years ago, he invented radio spectrum auctions. So how to auction the right to use the airwaves. And we do a lot of market design, a lot of expert witness consulting, and it's very fun. We love working with a lot of professors, heads of state, and Fortune 500 CEOs. And uh, I also love playing beach volleyball and having a great time with my two little kids and traveling all over the world. And, um, and that's about it. Thank you, Sylvia. Marga. The easier family name. <laughs> is this on? <laughs> no, it is, it is. Thank you. My name is Marga Gual Soler. So we all have some uh, you know, difficult to pronounce, uh, I guess. So Jack Philippe, you are excused. Um, Thank you. I am from Spain, from the beautiful island of Mallorca. Uh, many of you might know it. If not, you are all welcome. Uh, <laughs> this is how I started. They're all coming. <laughs> this is how I started my speech. Um, I am a scientist by training. I, I started my career in academia uh, uh, with a PhD in molecular biology. But then I moved to the world of diplomacy. So I try to bridge uh, worlds that do not normally speak to each other, like the worlds of science and, and, and very technical academic uh, topics uh, with world politics and diplomacy. So being here in Davos, my first time, is really, uh, of course, an amazing experience, but also a realization that there is a lot that we need to do to have evidence uh, informing our decision making and our policies and our global governance uh, frameworks. So I work with academia, with government, with the UN and with nonprofits. So I also have a bit of a portfolio career uh, working in advice, research and training just to build bridges. I specialize in bringing together countries that do not have diplomatic relations, have very difficult political issues through the language of science. As you know, mathematics, physics, that language is the same all over the world. We all share that language, and we can use that common language to tackle some other 
uh, more difficult questions, and also to come together to tackle the challenges that are transboundary, like climate or COVID. So everything that we're facing really uh, crosses borders. So I'm trying to bridge science and diplomacy to address them. Thank you. Thank you, Margaret. I'm not sure if I believe that this is your first Davos. I, wa I want proof. I think, I think this speaks to how well she's progressed in everything that she does. She comes to Davos day one. She takes over. We love it. We're going to start the next uh, first question with you. Um, you know, authenticity, right? That's, that's a key part of what we want to discuss here. And all three of you, in my view, really reflect what authenticity should be, right? That kind of connectivity between thoughts, words, and actions. And so the question for you and all three of you, is that nature or nurture? And if there is some nurture, was there a particular inflection point in your life that allowed you to just be that much more free and be your full self? So being from a small island, I grew up in a, with a very insular mindset. And when I became a scientist, I started to travel all around the world because scientific careers, that's what you uh, do. You go around the world, have conferences, and start meeting people from all backgrounds, cultures, and I realized that I was uh, slowly becoming the only woman, the only young person in rooms increasingly full of men and more senior people. And so I had to, I think the, the, the nurture is a, is a big piece because I had to adjust to that because it was not in my natural environment. And so I had to learn to, in the beginning, try to, to fit, to try to uh, make myself into those boxes that were expected. But then I realized that it was actually um, being myself and not uh, perhaps losing my accent. Uh, I lived in Washington, D.C., and in the U.S., many people told me if I wanted uh, accent uh, removal lessons. I didn't know that existed. I said, I think my accent is beautiful, and, and that means I speak more languages than you. <laughs> So I think this is an advantage and an asset. And so um, I think it's both. I, I guess some personalities uh, are you know, more, I've always been uh, kind of um, extrovert, yes. But finding myself as the only one trying to fit and then realizing that that was not the way, that they should accept me as I am, was liberating. And now I enjoy a lot of respect that I wouldn't know that I would achieve being authentic. And I try to get more women into this field and, and, and make them also, uh, and, you know, mentor them and, uh, and make them respect it and at the same time uh, keep their authenticity and their way of being. Thank you, Marga. We appreciate you. Sylvia. Uh, well, I guess it's both. Um, my dad was very similar to me in character. And I remember when I was a little girl, there was not many life lessons he gave me, but one he gave me, he said, you're like me. People will either love you or they will hate you. No one will be indifferent to you, just live with it. Mm -hmm. So I took that lesson to heart, and unlike Marga, I didn't even try to fit in ever. <laughs> so I just went straight for, all right, I'm just going to be myself, and people indeed either love me or they hate me. So they had to the, be loyal, or they cannot stand that I will just say what I think in a meeting. And uh, so I would say it's nature, because I took that from my father. But it's also like, um, same as Margot, I am usually the only woman in multi-billion dollar negotiations. And usually it is, uh, and, and men have been the biggest supporters, like very supportive. But some men always expect me to cave in when the negotiation comes, and I will never forget the shock of somebody when they said their offer, and I look at them and like, no. And they're like, what do you mean no? They just <laughs> did not expect it. Um, so I think it is both. And uh, I think uh, if I were to talk to like, younger women who are going to go out there. It's just like, know that there will be a lot of amazing men that will support you, and there will be some that will like push back and just don't worry, don't care about their opinion, just keep going. That's my suggestion. Thank you. Actually, authenticity is something which is I'm very passionate about. And, and I would say it's been a lifelong journey. So um, I wouldn't say, you know, when I actually studied engineering, so I'm a bit of a nerd of myself. And I was um, studying in Poland, and uh, it was not very popular to have a woman studying engineering. So actually, there were professors, old schools, who called me Mr. Say, no, 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 excuse me. <laughs> and they insisted, uh, Mr. I said, okay, 
and I kind of adjusted. <laughs> Clearly, then. Mister. I decided, okay. Um, um, so it was part of the experience, and uh, and actually I was uh, meant to be either a doctor or a lawyer. My parents had this idea for me, as many parents maybe from other countries do, that it will be really the safest job to have. So I last minute decided to study actually business and uh, first engineering, and then I did my masters in economics. Uh, and I remember my dad actually also said, Roxana, you end up like an assistant to a CEO. <laughs> So I thought, mm, okay, Dan, maybe I'll end up a CEO. So, uh, but, <laughs> but I do have to say that it hasn't been easy. And when I started um, working in finance, also finance very much male dominated. Um, I spent lots of time on the trading floors of big investment banks. Uh, but I always, always try to be myself, even though um, society and the trading floor was trying to put and frame us. And it wasn't only coming, it was interesting, because we all have biases, all of us. You and me, I'm always trying not to be, but it, it is a lifelong journey to me. And I really do feel that um, pa there is something that happens past 40, around this age, sometimes earlier, sometimes later. And I don't call it midlife crisis, it's a midlife opportunity. <laughs> But there is something woo that... Woo <laughs> An applause for this. <laughs> so, um, so I would say it, it's been a lot in my life. Like, I really want to be myself. And, you know, I'm a mother of two sons. And, you know, people put certain way. But sometimes we put it ourselves as well. So, so I would say I definitely with age. That's the advantage of getting older. Uh, we are much more, become much more authentic and true to ourselves. And it's almost, I wish I knew that before, but somehow there's no shortcuts on certain things. So now we can have a panel drinking champagne, for example. <laughs> and uh, I, uh, I love champagne. <laughs> you know, it's, uh, it's, I think it's a celebration. Uh, so uh, so it, it is a journey. There is no shortcuts, I think. Maybe some people get it earlier. Um, but uh, I, I truly believe that the, the more authentic you become uh, and not try to fit in, which is not easy, the better it gets. I agree with you, Roxana. The only thing I don't fully agree with her is that I'm pretty sure each of these three women are being extra modest because I've known them since before they were 40 and they were already really authentic. <laughs> <laughs> but, but they're underselling, um, but we appreciate them for that. Um, you know, we'll start with you, Roxana. You have a lot of options and different things that you can be doing that you're really good at, but you choose to do certain things and we know that it's because, you know, they're resonant with you. Can you share with the audience what is it that you're particularly passionate about right now and why that is? So I'm definitely passionate about champagne and authenticity. You've already learned about that. <laughs> uh, but um, so again, going back, I shared the story. I was meant to be a doctor, ended up studying engineering, and ended up in finance. Um, I would say um, there is, um, it wasn't popular, and now it became much more acceptable to, to lead, I call it portfolio life, not even career, but life. Because I, I, I'm a true believer that uh, to me, it's kind of all in one. Like, you know, they say about work-life balance. You know, I, I really now, I feel uh, I'm doing things I love with the people I enjoy. And it doesn't mean it's all rosy every day at all. Um, but um, I, I'm able to now connect lots of my passions. So being a financier for a long time, um, I've always been an artist and I have created kind of on the side. And I, when I became a um, uh, joint uh, management board of the biggest Polish bank listed company, they told me, look, you can't really talk about the art. It's kind of not serious. So, you know, people need to perceive you as this, you know, proper banker, not an artist. And, and I said, you know what, I am. And I was past 40, so I said, you know what, actually, I'm an artist too. So, uh, so I ended up, um, even though my first reaction, maybe I should, you know, really, that it's a listed company, they are very serious. And I ended up yeah, spending hours on the, um, in the boardroom with seven men and myself. Uh, it, was, um, it was my last corporate job. And it was an amazing experience, but it also taught me a lot uh, because I would say that um, now what I do, and again, I left the corporate world, but I'm still working now with corporates on my terms. So I chair impact advisory boards. And to me, the biggest passion has been impact. How can we create impact through our passions 
and um, and I'm doing it. I'm fusing all these different worlds. So I'm creating art pieces uh, now, currently sculptures linked to climate action, and I'm adding my engineering background and augmented reality and. Um, and also looking how can we shift financing into impact as well. So I don't know if it answers your question. <laughs> it absolutely <laughs> does. Thank you. Go on, moving right along. So I think um, I will actually tag on one of the things Roxana said about work-life balance. Um, so when I started the company, I was really determined to like, I was going to anyways have kids, I was going to keep playing beach volleyball, which I love, and keep having my friends and keep traveling to Europe every summer. <laughs> so we are talking 10 years ago, pre-pandemic, and we're talking about high stakes auctions. And so already then, the moment I became CEO, I said, okay, we're going remote. So we were doing most of our work remotely 10 years ago, which we couldn't say at the time, but now it's cool to say so we can say it. Um, so that, and, and also every time we would go on site for clients, uh, you know, there's an auction in Canada, the whole team flies there and we're all there for five weeks. So the traditional thing that consultant would do is like all of the employees that would working on the project would stay in hotel rooms. And I would negotiate with the client that like, number one, everybody would fly business class, even the junior team members. And number two, everybody would have apartments that were three bedroom apartments instead of hotel rooms because they could bring their family for like five weeks. And it was the same cost, but it was just like back then it was not normal for like people to use Airbnb because it was not there yet. So everybody, so I negotiated for every team member. And so we would have these great auctions which I would fly in a, a, a chef from Italy, we would have like, 10 apartments in the same building and they would all, and they would bring family, grandparents, kids, and like, so everybody was happy, no one was burning out, but that was not a traditional way of thinking. <laughs> then once I had kids, I was like, oh, well, I'm going to keep traveling, but I'm not going to give up being a mom. And so, actually, I mean, obviously this comes later in career when you have, you know, have the opportunity of doing it and you're lucky enough to be able to do it, but actually did not do the traditional schooling. We have a tutor that travels with us, they're homeschooled, they do the exams in Oxford, so I can keep traveling and the kids come with me whenever, and I can have it all. So it's a little bit, uh, that, that was the choice, life, work, balance, and uh, yes, I keep playing beach volleyball, and the kids travel everywhere, they speak four languages, and they love it. And they love that mom has a career, so that's, that's, that's cool with them. And, and <laughs> let me just say a couple of things. I don't know if you felt the audience leaning in. You're, you're definitely changing a lot in terms of how they're thinking about their next vacations and <laughs> how they think about work. And, uh, and negotiation for the next uh, on site. <laughs> absolutely. And, and Sylvia's children are amazing. So uh, it's very impressive. Uh, so let's keep it moving over to Marga. So I'm passionate. Recently, I became an advisor to, to a new foundation in Geneva that tries to merge science and science fiction. So they look at 2050. Uh, they talk to scientists today about what, uh, how feasible some technologies are going to become uh, in 2050, 2100, right? And they're trying to walk backwards from that world to the present, right? So using the future to build the present, basically. And I realize by this exercise how much of those technologies are shaped by a very small number and type of people. And I became very concerned because those technologies can be used for good, as in solving our biggest challenges, but also have uh, uh, negative, can have very negative consequences. I'm talking about anything from AI to quantum computing to neurotechnologies to geoengineering. So all of those technologies are in different degrees of development. Some of them are still very utopian, but we need to prepare now in case they become uh, um, a reality. And we have here in, in Davos a lot of these uh, entrepreneurs and, and startups and companies that are actually working to advance them very fast. And I realize that people that are shaping those technologies are not representing the diversity of the world. So adding a layer to this work, I basically came in uh, only looking at the technical and what's feasible and how long is this quantum computer going to take? Is it five, 10 years? But actually, what questions should we be asking? And who decides is really coming from the, the pool of people that participate. So now I'm very concerned and also very passionate and, and motivated to really broaden the pool of people who contribute to thinking about what should we invent, what should we develop, and what should we not develop as technology and innovation, because otherwise those benefits are only going to be reaped by a few, and we're going to perpetuate the inequalities 
and uh, the discrimination that we've been um, seeing until now. So that is my passion, and hopefully, I know uh, you are all into this very much as well, so we can all work together. Thank you, Margo. In case I hadn't already said so, make sure you know, sign me up. I, I want to be part, I want to support, and I encourage everyone in the room to do whatever we can to be supportive of the amazing work that they're doing, because I think you can agree that Yes, it's true what they're doing is work, but really what they're doing is trying to ensure that the future generations have a better experience than, than what we have, and it's important to um, recognize that, so thank you. Um, the uh, female quotient is amazing with planning. I have a little clock here, and, it, and it's, it's moving down really quickly. So in the audience, if you guys have questions, I'm gonna ask one more question, and then if there are some questions, we'll try to get one or two as quickly as possible. So I just wanna give you a fair warning. So we're gonna mix it up and start with Sylvia. Uh, the final question for me is, what advice do you have, especially for young women that hope to chart careers like yours, or even better than yours, <laughs> if that's possible? Well, for one, go for it. <laughs> and. Uh, Second, I think if you want to have the work-life balance, one of the things I found is that 80%, it's the 80-20 rule and I apply it as a 90-10. Um, so 90% of the, of the output of what I need to do can be achieved with like 10%, like the top percent of work. Like you, you could like skip most of it. So I have become very good at optimizing and figuring out quickly what is the top percent of the things I need to do to get 90% of the way there work-wise and just deal with like not being perfect because otherwise you cannot do it all. So that's, that's what I would say, like figure out as quickly as possible, if it's possible in your career path, figure out what are the most important things you have to achieve and prioritize those so you can still have a life, friends, family, et cetera, outside. So I think that's my advice. I like that. Marga. I think a lot of this advice, sometimes it feels like feel good advice and, and we have to acknowledge that at the individual level, there's so there only so much we can do. I think we don't have to forget that there are still structural and societal barriers that no matter how much we can make change individually and we can change ourselves and we can be motivated, I think we don't have to lose sight of that. So the advice really is not just for the young women, it's for the men and for everybody in power and everybody in politics and everybody in business and uh, across the, the board to really start top down removing those barriers because we're, I think we're focusing on the individual women and of course we can uh, try to mentor and, and, and they are amazing, uh, but there's only so much they can do if the environment is not conducive because those structural and, and kind of higher order barriers. So I think we talk sometimes too much to the women and not enough to the ecosystem that enables or makes possible that advancement. So advice is, yeah. is broader than to the women. Thank you, Margo. Roxana. <laughs> so I agree with Margo as well. The, the, it's very individual and also um, to me, I really believe that this work life, whatever, the balance, it really does not exist. Okay, so I think if we start accepting this balance doesn't exist, <laughs> but maybe let's try to get close to the balance. So, so, so for that, it's, it's what I found very easy, which actually I became quite um, obsessed in my art as well, incorporating the concept of kintsugi. Uh, it's a philosophy. Uh, it's, so when you break an object, whatever the object is, let's say a plate, you can either throw it away or you can piece it together with gold. And the object actually becomes more beautiful for having been broken. So there is hope. You don't have to be a perfectionist. And just really this authenticity that you beautifully put in as a theme it's important, but it's a journey. So don't feel pressurized when you are young. I had no idea, you know, like I tried, I thought I'm authentic, but it's a journey. So that's... Thank you, Roxana. And, and just to advertise for Roxana, since she won't do it herself, look her up and look up, look up, look at the, look up, look up the broken art piece. She has this globe that she designed that is kind of broken, but it's not because it's mended by gold. And she's transported to like, you know, world events. It's probably here in Davos as well, but definitely look it up. It's really amazing. Well, thank you. I just wanted to give a shout out to Kaz, who co-created the art piece with me. So she's here in the audience. So Absolutely. thank you. So, it's all about co-creation. So, you know, I believe 
one of the greatest resources is knowledge, and the panelists have really shared some gems with us. 80-20 principle to begin, but, move, but move to 90-10, right? It's, it's not just about women. It's about the full spectrum and the balance. I'm a lifelong martial artist. It's kind of the yin and the yang and understanding that, that in between, the two actually don't exist, right? And as far as we can move towards that center, it's amazing. And it's being free. It's not putting pressure on yourself. It's forgiving yourself. It's forgiving others. And it's about being accepting and it's being authentic. And the last thing I just wanted to say, you know, for an amazing moderator, he himself should be featured, but truly what he's doing and how he's actually managing to connect everyone and bring the best in people and being so supportive, I think it's very special. So thank you for bringing us together. Thank you. Woo! Woo All right, so the clock ended. Can I get one question? One question? Yeah, All right. here we go. All right. I, thank you so much. I think it's really interesting how you've all had a, like a dynamic career journey. So what words of advice would you give for, let's say, changing your career or even, let's say, evolving it slowly to become something even greater? <laughs> okay, I'll try. <laughs> So I've, I've uh, transited many sectors, so academia, government, uh, international organizations, NGOs. And every time I felt there was a reinvention and I struggled. So actually, I'm going to answer with the struggles. Not, so, not, I don't know if I have it figured out. But one thing that I probably did, and it was a mistake, is to stay too uh, uh, anchored into an identity that depends too much on your job or your employer, on the institution that you're in for too long. It, that, that then the, the, the separation between you and that company or organization, it blurs. So you, your identity kind of becomes tied to that. And then it's really hard when you kind of exit that uh, position, you, you feel like stepping into the void and losing that umbrella. So for us that uh, do this now portfolio career and we get our own partnerships, our own clients, it's for me, and I, I'm very honest, it's a bit intimidating because now I don't have the big brand above my head. It's just me, Marga. So now I have to be uh, valued because of my talent and my intellect and my accomplishment, but no longer because I represent company or government, organization, so and so. So that was very frightening, and I, it took me a while to be comfortable with it. Um, so I don't know if the advice uh, is to not uh, be afraid to make the leap and lose those big titles um, because they will not they do not define you and if you are anchored for too, for too long to them I think that you lose on opportunities of growth and just taking yourself out of that space that maybe you become too comfortable and leap to the next level is there is there anything to add to that it sounds like a drop the mic type moment so please join me in heaping all types of praise on these wonderful women for the work that they do in such an authentic manner. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you guys for turning up and listening to us. Thank you. Appreciate it.